wonderful crowd today, and I think you'll be really pleased that you came. Our guest speaker is Michael Bruno. Uh, he's going to speak on human origins and antiquity, a native perspective. Uh, the Vedic historical texts contain accounts of the human presence extending much further back in time than modern science allows. There is archaeological evidence consistent with this, and Michael will review some examples of such evidence as documented in his book, Forbidden Archaeology, and he will share his experiences in presenting it to scientific audiences, which I'm sure will be amusing. Uh, I know what it's like to present forbidden information to scientific audiences. Their, their facial expressions are always a wonder to behold. Um, Michael is an independent researcher in human origins and antiquity. He's a member of the World Archaeological Congress and the European Association of Archaeologists. Uh, and he is the principal author of the book Forbidden Archaeology, a comprehensive historical survey of archaeological anomalies. He's also the author of Human Devolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory, uh, in which he examines human origins and antiquity from a worldview with its foundations in ancient Indian thought. So I hope that whets your appetite. And Michael, are you <laughs> are you ready? Come, welcome. here in Princeton. About 10 days ago I was in Bern, Switzerland for a meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists. And when I was there, I visited the Einstein house because it was in Bern that Einstein wrote his most famous paper about the theory of relativity and related topics. So it was kind of interesting that my next stop is Princeton, which is also connected with Einstein, and I went to the Einstein house just before arriving here. So wonderful to be in Princeton. And thank you for coming here this afternoon to hear something about uh, human antiquity and origins, a Vedic perspective. I'm going to share with you some of my ideas and evidence from my books on these topics, along with reactions to my work from scientists and academics, and I'll also be giving a little personal history as part of that. So, why a Vedic perspective. Uh, to understand that, we have to understand something about my transcultural identity. And I'm using transculturality in the sense that it was explained by the German philosopher Wolfgang Welch, who wrote, for most of us, multiple cultural connections are decisive in terms of our cultural formation. We are cultural hybrids. So what kind of cultural hybrid am I? In 1966, I was part of American Cold War culture. I entered the George Washington University School of Foreign Affairs with the idea of preparing for a career in one of the intelligence services. <clears throat> My father was an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force. But <clears throat> by 
1968, I left the university and become part of America's <clears throat> counterculture of the time. Excuse me. By 1976, I came in another cultural move. I became a disciple of a guru from India, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And today, I'm a transcultural hybrid, integrating East and West, science and spirituality. It's not easy being transcultural. It's not easy being trans anything. But uh, that's, that's the connection. So what's the specific connection with human antiquity? Uh, as part of my spiritual practice, I've studied the Puranas, the Vedic historical writings of ancient India. And they contain accounts of extreme human antiquity, of a human presence on this planet going back many millions of years. Now that's something quite different than the modern scientific consensus, which has humans like us coming into existence about 200,000 years ago. So how do I deal with the contradiction? <clears throat> I made a prediction along with my co-religionist Richard Thompson. And we made a, a prediction. If the Quranic accounts of extreme human activity are true, there should be reports of archaeological evidence for extreme human activity going back many millions of years. And my methodology for testing that prediction was to examine all archaeological reports from the time of Darwin to the present. Now I divide the scientific literature into two parts, primary and secondary. Primary literature means literature by geologists, archaeologists, and others published in the professional scientific journals. And then secondary literature is based on that, textbooks and so forth. So my first finding wasn't really so surprising. There are no reports of evidence for extreme human antiquity in the current secondary literature textbooks. Second finding is a little more interesting. There are many reports of evidence for extreme human antiquity in the primary scientific literature, past and present. And we collected those in this book, Forbidden Archaeology. So, Arises. Why is this evidence not in the secondary literature of textbooks today, if it is there in the primary scientific literature? And I believe that's because of a process of knowledge filtration that operates in the world of science. You know, we can call the blue box up there the knowledge filter, and what it represents is the dominant consensus in a scientific discipline. Some people call it a paradox, and that was the term that was popularized by the philosopher of science, Thomas Cohn, in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. Uh, he took paradigm to mean the set of theories and ideas that define what is possible and rational to do in a scientific discipline. For example, the Darwinian evolutionary paradigm. 
but it will come in this in this paradigm. He wrote, in the absence of the paradigm, all of the facts that could possibly pertain to the development of a given science are likely to seem equally relevant. But once you have a time, uh, a paradigm, once you have a paradigm, it becomes possible to judge the relevance of different categories of evidence. And the general procedure is that evidence that conforms to the consensus, conforms to the paradigm, passes through this intellectual filter. Whereas evidence that doesn't conform to the paradigm or consensus is filtered out. And Crum wrote, normal science often suppresses fundamental qualities because they are subversive of its basic commitments. And we can call novelties anomalies. But he said, also, such novelties, such anomalies, can be the foundation of progress in science. He wrote, discovery commences with the awareness of anomaly. That is, with the recognition that nature has somehow violated the paradigm-induced expectations that govern normal science. So this book is a collection of anomalies in the field of archaeology. And you know, this was recognized by some of the reviewers of the book. French archaeologist Marilyn Patrouille wrote in her review of the big archaeology in La Anthropologie. Uh, Cremon and Thompson have written a provocative work that raises the problem of the influence of the dominant ideas of a time period on scientific research. These ideas can compel the researchers to orient their analyses according to the conceptions that are permitted by the scientific community. So I'm going to give uh, a few examples of the kind of evidence that I'm talking about. In the 19th century, gold was discovered in California. Miners went there to get it. They dug tunnels into the sides of mountains, such as Table Mountain in the Sierra Nevada Mountains of California. Deep inside these tunnels, the miners found human bones and human artifacts. What makes them so interesting to me is they were found in layers of rock that modern geologists tell us are about 50 million years old from the Eocene period. These discoveries were announced to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney who was the chief government geologist of California. His report was published by Harvard University in 1880. But we don't hear very much about these discoveries today because of the process of knowledge filtration. Uh, this is the anthropologist William Holmes of the Smithsonian Institution contemporary of Whitney. So he said, perhaps if Professor Whitney had fully appreciated the story of human evolution as it is understood today, he would have hesitated to announce the conclusions formulated, notwithstanding an opposing array of testimony with which he was confronted. I'll translate that for you. <laughs> Means if the facts don't fit the theory, the facts have to be cast aside. Basically, that's what he said, and basically, that's what happened. However, some of the artifacts from the California gold mines are still in the collection of the Museum of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. And I got permission from the directors of the museum to study and photograph them. 
Uh, I also went into the Sierra Nevada Mountains. This is Table Mountain as it looks today. And we were able to relocate some of the 19th century uh, gold mining tunnels where these objects were originally discovered. In more recent times, archaeologists in the United Kingdom discovered footprints at a place called Hoppingsbury in the UK. They were found in layers of rock almost one million years old. The archaeologists conducted a detailed analysis of the size and shape of the footprints and found they matched the size and shape of the feet of living populations of anatomically modern humans. But they could not attribute the footprints to Homo sapiens because according to their way of looking at things, Homo sapiens did not exist at that time. So they attributed the footprints to a hominid that they believed lived in Europe at that time, Homo antecessor. So they interpreted the footprints in a matter that allowed them to hang on to their theoretical preconceptions. So what's going on here? Uh, an influential psychology experiment may help us understand. In this experiment, psychologists altered some of the cards in a normal deck. And for example, they took uh, four cards normally should be red, they made it black. They took the six of spades, normally black, made it red. And then, you know, they showed the cards in the deck, which contained some of these altered cards, to subjects very quickly. And they asked the subjects to identify the cards. So what happened is people were, they, they couldn't perceive the anomalies. You know, they look at the four of hearts and say four of spades. <laughs> In other words, they would interpret what they actually saw according to their expectations. And Thomas Kuhn cited this particular experiment in his work. He said, in science, as in the playing card experiment, novelty emerges only with difficulty manifested by resistance against a background provided by expect, expectation. And I'll give a fairly recent example of that. In 2015, archaeologists published a report about the OH-86 finger bone that was found at Ulduvai Gorge in Tanzania, a country in East Africa. It was found in layers of rock 1,840,000 years old. Uh, it was a left, fifth, proximal, manual phalanx. It, uh, it was very carefully studied by the archaeologists. They compared the measurements of this finger bone to the same bone in different species, chimpanzee, gorilla, macaque, baboon. They also compared it to uh, the same finger bone as found in Australopithecus, Homo habilis, and other hominids. They also compared it to the finger bone of anatomically modern humans. They found OH86 fit squarely in the modern human group. And they concluded in their scientific report published in Nature Communications, OH86 represents a hominid species whose closest form affinities are to modern Homo sapiens. However, the geological age 
of OH eighty six obviously precludes its assignment to Homo sapiens. In other words, they find this finger bone, they very carefully study it, they determine it's just like that of Homo sapiens, anatomically modern humans. It's different from any other hominid, any other ape or monkey. And they say, but because of the age of the formation in which it's found, we cannot assign it to Homo sapiens. But I say, why not? Now, Thomas Kuhn wrote significantly, no part of the aim of normal science is to call forth new sorts of phenomena. Indeed, those that will not fit the box are often not seen at all. In other words, scientists can be staring directly at an anomaly and not recognize it as such. And just say, well, that, that can be. And they'll make it fit. Uh, their normal expectations. So I would say, why not OH86 should be assigned to Homo sapiens and be given an age of 1,840,000 years. So forbidden archaeology is a collection of such anomalies and we may wonder, well, what was the academic and scientific response? So we can look at some of the academic reviews. Uh, reviews were published in most of the scientific journals that deal with the field of human origins and antiquity. And as you might expect, some of them were negative, some even harshly so, but even the critics sometimes acknowledge positive aspects of the work. You know, for example, archaeologist Tim Murray wrote in his review published in his uh, British Journal for the History of Science. Forbidden archaeology provides the historian of archaeology with a useful compendium of case studies in the history and sociology of scientific knowledge, which can be used to foster debate within archaeology about how to describe the epistemology of one's discipline. And that's exactly what we were trying to do by publishing that book, provoke debate in archaeology about the epistemology of that discipline. He also wrote, forbidden archaeology is designed to demolish the case for biological and cultural evolution and to advance the cause of a Vedic alternative. Guilty as charged. Uh, now, really, it's, I mean, more seriously, at this point, when you say something like Vedic alternative in a scientific journal, a lot of people are going to react by saying, definitely not. Not Vedic, not Islamic, not Buddhist, not Christian, nothing from any spiritual source whatsoever should have any place at all in scientific discourse. It's a very common position. But what Tim Murray went on to say, I found very interesting. He said, the dominant paradigm has changed and is changing, and practitioners openly debate issues which go right to the conceptual core of the discipline. Whether the Vedas have a role to play in this is up to the individual scientist's concern. And I think that's a pretty good position, one that I can support. No outright ban, but it's just up to the individual scientist's concern. 
One of the more significant reviews was a 23-page review article published in Social Studies of Science by Joe Wodak and David Oldroy. So they asked, so has forbidden archaeology made any contribution to the literature on paleoanthropology? Our answer is a guarded yes for two reasons. First, much of the historical material Primo and Thompson resurrect has not been scrutinized in such detail before. Second, Primo and Thompson do raise a central problematic regarding the lack of certainty in scientific truth claims. In other words, scientists attach different levels of certainty to their theories. Now, they attach a level of practically absolute certainty to their theories about human origins and antiquity. So, Wodak uh, and Oldroy thought that we had done a good job in problematizing, attaching that level of certainty to those theories. I thought maybe we should just bring it down a little, at least. Uh, and, and I'm just sharing with you a couple of things here. Actually, you could write a whole book about it. And I think I forgot. I actually did write a whole book about it. It's called Forbidden Archaeology's Impact, where I collected all of the academic and scientific responses, my correspondence with scientists pro and con about uh, this topic and related issues. And that book got its own review in Public Understanding of Science, where Simon Locke, a sociologist from the UK, wrote that it was consistent and courageous. He wrote, Primo has provided here a resource of considerable richness and value to analysts of public understanding of science. It should also make a useful teaching resource as one of the best documented cases of, quote, science wars, and raising a wide range of issues covering aspects of knowledge transfer in a manner sure to be provocative in the classroom. But you know, the main thing about forbidden archaeology, as I said, is it's a collection of anomalies. And this collection of anomalies contradicts you know, the current mainstream dominant scientific conception or paradigm of human origins. So, in his review of forbidden archaeology and geoarchaeology, Ken Thayer wrote, when you attempt to deconstruct a well-accepted paradigm, it is reasonable to expect that a new paradigm be suggested in its place. The authors of Forbidden Archaeology are open about their membership in the Bhaktivedanta Institute, which is a branch of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. They make a reasonable request regarding their affiliation, affiliation with this organization, quoting from our introduction. That our theoretical outlook is derived from the Vedic literature should not disqualify. And he goes on to say, fair enough, but what is their theoretical <coughs> outlook? So, this book is my answer to that question. Human devolution, a Vedic alternative to theory.
Now this book attracted its own set of academic and scientific reviews. Uh, Jeffrey Schwartz, an anthropologist, wrote in his review of human evolution in history and philosophy of the life scientists, quote, as a faded, non-Western alternative to Darwinism, it is also an alternative to the literature that has come from scientific creations. In other words, intelligent design theories, Christian creations, etc. That contrast is interesting and might be of interest to readers of this journal. So if you're going to say something, it might as well be interesting. So, in this book, I propose that before we even ask the question, where did human beings come from, we should first of all ask the question, what is a human being? Now that's an ontological question. And today, the ontology of modern science is very materialistic, matter-focused. So the tendency among scientists today is to say that a human being or any other living thing is a machine made of matter. Specifically, they'll say we're machines made of molecules. They say life came from chemicals. That's the standard idea today. Now, it's in trouble right from the start. You know, there are dozens of theories about how life may have emerged from chemicals early in the life's history, but none of them have won widespread acceptance in the world of science. If you look at the recent scientific literature, you'll find many statements like this. When, where, and how did life on Earth originate? These questions on the origin of life are among the biggest unsolved problems in natural science. And then just assuming, you know, you get some first single-celled creature emerging from chemicals somehow or other, then how do you go to multicellular creatures? How do you get something like a human being with trillions of cells organized into very complex organs? How do you get this extreme variety of body plants, of different plants and animals. Again, if you go through the modern scientific literature, you'll find statements like this. Foremost among the unresolved problems confronting modern biology is the origin of biological complexity, most notably that of the shape and form of our own bodies, or the second one. Among the most interesting and fundamental unanswered questions in biology are, one, how did animal body plans first arise? And two, how have the animal body plans remained essentially unchanged since their emergence? So, I go over all of these topics in chapter four of Human Devolution, which is called Genes, Design, and Design. I go over evidence from genetics and molecular biology related to the uh, question of the origins of life and the development of body plans and structures. And in this review of human devolution, talking about this chapter, Jeffrey Schwartz says, Primo takes on biology 
biochemistry and genetics. To further his argument that Darwinian evolution fails to account for discrepancies in the evidence. Here, Cremo relies particularly heavily on scientific creationist literature to back up his claims. And I did cite extensively from the works of Michael Bay and others. So then, what do you think the next sentence in his review is going to be? Cremo relies particularly heavily on scientific creationist literature to back up his claims. What I expected was him to say in his next sentence, and therefore, nothing this man said should be taken at all seriously from the scientific point of view. What he actually wrote was a, a little more interesting. Interestingly, both his criticism and those of scientific creationists, especially of so-called molecular systematics, are actually worth paying attention to. For if one is not blinded by the technology of DNA sequencing, or by the notion that for metazoan, multicellular life, uh, <clears throat> that DNA is the blueprint of life, then the untested assumptions underlying assertions of relatedness, time to the merchants, etc., that derive from the imposition of Darwinian thinking on genetic or molecular data become remarkably clear. So, it turns out, Schwartz, He's an evolutionist, but he's not a Darwinist. So, interesting. But now we come to the main problem, consciousness. Most scientists today believe that consciousness is produced by molecules in the brain. But they've never shown exactly how this has occurred. So, basically, what I find is that operating on the basis of its materialist ontology, science has not been able to answer fundamental questions about the origin of the first living things, the origins of body plans for organisms, or the origin of consciousness. Of course, one solution is to continue working within the same materialist ontology and hope for better results in the future sometime. Another possible approach is to change the ontology, expand the ontology, and now, this is actually already being done in important domains of modern science, like astrophysics. Until the 1970s, when astronomers looked up at the sky, they tried to explain everything they could observe in terms of ordinary matter operating according to known physical laws. But they found they weren't able to do that. They weren't able to explain the spiral structure of galaxies in that way. So what they did is they expanded their ontology. They added new substances. They brought in what they call dark matter that can't be perceived in any normal way but has a gravitational effect on ordinary matter. And they found even that wasn't enough to explain what they observed. So more recently, they've introduced an even stranger new thing they call dark energy, which has a force that operates the opposite of gravity. Gravity attracts dark energy, pushes things outward. So that today, 
the astrophysicists think the universe is composed of only 5% ordinary matter, 30% dark matter, approximately, and 65% dark energy. But the, the, the main point I'm trying to make here is to explain what they observed, they expanded their ontology. And I'm suggesting the same thing is necessary in biology. We can't explain everything we observe about human beings or other living things in terms of ordinary matter alone. We need to do, we, we need to add new substances. We need to expand our ontology. And I'm not the only one saying this. Uh, Rodney Brooks of the Artificial Life Lab at MIT a few years ago wrote an interesting article in Nature. So there might be some extra sort of stuff in living systems outside our current scientific understanding. Among the possibilities, he suggested some ineffable entity such as a soul or Elon Vital, some vital force. In more recent times, Thomas Nagel, professor of philosophy at New York University, wrote in his book, Mind and Cosmos, which has a very provocative uh, subtitle, why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. <laughs> he got a lot of trouble for writing that. But in, in this book, he comments on the need for scientists to consider expanding their ontology. He said, Major scientific advances often require the creation of new concepts postulating unobservable elements of reality. The evidence for the existence of such things is precisely that if they existed, they would explain what is otherwise incomprehensible. And he recognized the this, this special need to do this in the case of consciousness. Consciousness, he wrote, is the most conspicuous obstacle to a comprehensive naturalism that relies only on the resources of physical science. If we take this problem seriously and follow out its implications, it threatens to unravel the entire naturalistic world picture. And putting it very succinctly, he said, conscious subjects and their mental lives are inescapable components of reality not describable by the physical science. So, to explain conscious subjects and their mental lives, their minds, I propose Introducing to our picture of biology a subtle material mind element which can act on ordinary matter in ways that cannot be explained by our current understanding. <laughs> and in addition to that, I propose adding a totally non material conscious self. And here, when I'm talking about mind and consciousness, I'm not talking about temporary byproducts of biochemical activity in the brain. I mean real substances for their own independent existence. It's an expanded ontology for biology. Uh, to put this in a Vedic perspective, a human being or any other organism has a gross physical body made of the ordinary material elements like carbon, calcium, iron, and so on. Beyond that, there is a subtle mental body which can 
act on ordinary matter in ways we cannot explain by our current laws of physics. And beyond that is the pure conscious self. And in some systems of Vedic thought, you know, the gross physical body is called the stula sharira, the mental body is called the sukshma sharira, and the eternal conscious subject is called the nitya sharira or eternal sharira. You can think of this in terms of a computer analogy, if you like, where the gross physical body is compared to computer hardware. The mental body, which the mental body we can compare to computer software, which allows the user to interact with the hardware, and the conscious self we can compare to the computer user. So is there any scientific evidence for the existence of these new substances? First, let's consider the subtle material mind element. Is there any scientific evidence for that? And I believe there is, but it's been subjected to this knowledge filtering process. And I'm going to start with some evidence from the 19th century, which many people today will find very quaint. But I still think it's, it's significant. I, I'm basically uh, an, an historian of science, so I get fascinated by the history of these things. Uh, this is Alfred Russell Wallace, who was along with Darwin, the co-founder of the theory of evolution by natural selection. And for a long time, the theory was called the Wallace-Darwin theory of evolution. And you may wonder, well, why isn't it called that today? Why is it called just the Darwin theory? Well, the problem is that Wallace became involved in psychical research. And Darwin wrote in the letter saying, by getting involved in these things, you're murdering our child in the theory of evolution by natural selection. So that kind of created a rift in between uh, the co-founders of that theory. So, Wallace was joined in his research by another prominent English scientist, Sir William Crookes, who was the president of the Royal Society, England's topmost scientific organization. And together, Wallace and Crookes were doing experiments with mediums, among them Daniel Douglas Hume. And Hume could do some interesting things. He could take an accordion and holding it at the top opposite the keys. You could cause it to play very elaborate tunes. So the scientists Wallace and Crooks have decided to make a cage like this where they have Hume hold the accordion at the top with the keys at the bottom and he would be sitting like this, so his other hand and feet could touch the keys of the accordion. And they found it would still play elaborate tunes. And even beyond that, they said at times, Hume would take his hand out of the cage, put it on the top of the table, and the accordion would be seen floating in the cage by itself, playing very elaborate tunes. Now, skeptics have tried to explain this phenomenon. I've carefully gone through their literature, and they don't offer any first-hand evidence of any deception or anything like that. Basically, they offer speculations of how things 
might have gone on in such a way that the researchers were deceived. Uh, for example, one of them said, uh, here, turn the accordion upside down, attach a false keyboard on the bottom, and had the real keyboard on top, and it's playing like that. No evidence, just a speculation. Another more modern uh, researcher, Paul Kurtzman, he must have attached a thread to a hook on the bottom and was able to do it like that. Somebody else suggested, actually somebody else was playing an accordion in another room, and that's how the sounds were made. And James Randi said he had a little harmonium in his mouth. No evidence, but lots of speculation. So, Pierre and Marie Curie were other prominent scientists doing experiments with mediums. They did experiments with an Italian medium named Eusebia Palladino. And they conducted these experiments as part of a group of 20 prominent European scientists in Paris early in the 20th century. And Pierre Curie, Nobel Prize winning physicist, noted that on one occasion they had the medium of the Psychology Institute in Paris, and under what he called perfect conditions, of observation, they noticed a large table floating about a meter off the ground in the presence of this uh, woman. But these days, people prefer more of a hard science approach to these questions. And that brings me to the work of Robert John and Brenda Dunn, which they began with the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Group at Princeton. And a lot of their work had to do with random event generators. For example, random number generators. And they found that the subjects of their experiments were able to influence the output of these random event generators to a small but statistically significant degree. And I take that as evidence for the existence of a subtle mind element associated with the human organism that can act on ordinary matter in ways that are very difficult to explain in terms of our current <coughs> laws of physics. And I cited their work in my book, Human Devolution. Now, another aspect of that work was uh, uh, involving remote viewing. And the protocol that they employed in these remote viewing experiments went, went like this. Uh, there was a target location where there was a person they called an agent. And the agent would focus on, on the nature of that place and record in writing on the check sheet the characteristics of that place. And then also photograph or film it. At a remote location, there's another participant called the recipient who was to mentally focus and record whatever impressions he or she was able to get from 
the target location. And these were recorded on a check sheet. And then later, the two would be compared and see what the hit rate was. So again, the recipients were able to perceive some of the information about the target location where the agent was located. And a few years ago, I just happened by chance more or less to be a participant in an experiment like that. It, it, it so happened that Stephen Schwartz, who was a, a remote viewing researcher, and I were speaking at the same conference in, in Montreal. And he came to my lecture, I came to his. In his lecture, he had a workshop. And in, in this workshop, there were about 100 of us. He selected three people, said, get in your car, go anywhere you want within a 15 minute radius, and stay there and film the place. He gave them a video camera. So it's basically the same protocol. You have your agents at a target location, and then you have your recipients, people like me, remaining in the hotel. And uh, we were instructed, just clear your minds, uh, and after 15 minutes, we were asked to start recording what impressions we were getting in our, in our, in our minds. And you know, we were instructed, don't think about it, don't rationalize about it, just put it, put it down. So I did that. The first image that came to my mind was candles and red glass holders. And I was convinced these people had gone to a bowling alley, so I, I said, okay. But I thought, okay, let me just go along with the protocol. And later they came back, they took the video machine, you know, they took the videotape, put it in the machine. And the first image that came on the screen was <coughs> candles and red glass holders. They had gone to the cathedral in Montreal. And I believe in all this stuff. I was kind of amazed myself. Now, what I found significant about the work of uh, Robert John and Brenda Dunn is they appear, from my reading, to have concluded that to explain these sorts of things, there's a need to expand the ontology. And Robert John, in one of his publications, put this chart out there, this matrix where you have at the top the conscious mind and tangible matter, ordinary matter as I would call it, and you see some interaction in between the consciousness and the matter and the matter and the consciousness. Two-way interaction going on there. That's normal perception. But these anomalous types of perceptions and actions, they attribute to an expanded ontology that would include uh, what they call subtangible matter and subconscious mind. And that's responsible for the anomalous types of events. And Another version of this matrix, Robert John added a couple of elements, which I found very interesting. <clears throat> uh, he kept you know, the conscious self and the material events involving tangible matter at the top, the unconscious 
mind and intangible matter down below, but he added something he called the subliminal sea and stated that the whole system had to have had some source. And that is the cause or method of explanation of these topics. And kind of converting that a little bit to my vacant perspective, you know, I can see as being the source of matter and consciousness, spirit and matter, if you will, a common source, the paramatma, or the super soul, and the Vedic ontology does involve subtle material elements in addition to the gross physical elements. So it's uh, a paradigm or a, a matrix here that I find worth exploring in terms of Vedic perspectives on human origins, antiquity, and consciousness. <clears throat> But uh, the main thing is, if we're going to talk about human origins, we have to consider matter, mind, and consciousness as independently existing objects. So what about scientific evidence for a conscious self that can exist beyond ordinary matter? I think there is such evidence. It comes from medical studies of out-of-body experiences. It comes from uh, past life studies involving reincarnation. In reincarnation, there can be a kind of evolution of the conscious self through different species of bodies. But there is no evolution of the kind that Darwin imagined. And here we have to go back to the Vedic picture that an organism, specifically the human organism, is composed of a gross physical body, the school sharira, a subtle mental and intellectual body, the sukshma sharira, and the conscious self, the soul. So, Basically, you have down here the soul. It has its own spiritual identity, but in the world of matter, it forgets it. And by false ego, it identifies with a subtle mental body. And that subtle mental body stays with the soul during its entire period of time in the material world, which can be many, many millions of lifetimes, one after another. Lifetimes in terms of gross physical bodies up here. So the eternal conscious self is connected with a subtle material mental body by false ego or ahankara. And I believe it is that subtle material mental body that undergoes a process of modification continuously. It's the subtle mental body that is evolving, you could say. And according to its condition during a particular segment of time, you get a particular gross physical body. And an entire array of them is available in the cosmos. So in one lifetime, you might have an eight body, and the next lifetime, an eight man body, the next lifetime, a uh, homo sapiens human body. That's discrete and changing. What is continually 
what is continuous and being modified is the subtle mental body. And unchanging is the actual conscious self. So those are some thoughts on that. Now this idea that the human being is composed of matter, mind, and consciousness leads to the idea that we exist in a multi-level cosmos, that there's a region of the cosmos dominated by ordinary matter, inhabited by beings, adapted to the conditions there. There's a more subtle realm, subtle material realm of the cosmos dominated by subtle mental and intellectual energies. It's inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. Beyond that, there's what I call the realm of pure consciousness, the purely spiritual realm. So I want to ask, how are we doing on time? Getting close. Getting close. How much more time do you think? Finish up saying five minutes. Okay, so I'll give a five minute finish to this. And I talk about that multi-level cosmos in chapter seven of human devolution. And I note that the same basic idea is found in many different cultures around the world, as is the idea of matter, mind, and spirit being the components of living organisms. And there's a great deal of scientific evidence for the existence of, of such things. I'll just mention Dr. John Mack of Harvard University uh, writing, it appears ever more likely that we exist in a multi-dimensional cosmos. The cosmos appears to be filled with beings, creatures, spirits, intelligences, gods. One of the reviewers of Human Devolution, C. Mackenzie Brown, wrote in his review, Primo provides an extensive and thoroughly researched catalog of alien abduction, seances, paranormal apparition, psychokinesis, and the like. It is all there. The remainder of this view, however, will not rehearse the standard skeptic arguments against such but we'd rather focus on what is by far the most creative and imaginative part of human devolution, its concluding chapter on the Vedic theory of human devolution. And by that I mean that is personal, individual, conscious entities. Our origin is not the world of matter. Our origin our natural place of existence is what I call the level of pure consciousness and Vedic terminology. You could call it Brahman. Uh, people have different names for it. But that's our original position. Some conscious selves come down to the level of the subtle material elements that become covered by them. And others go further down and receive a covering not only the subtle mental energies, but the gross physical energies. And that's where we find ourselves now. Uh, to put that more in a Vedic perspective, uh, the topmost level, the level of pure consciousness, you've got God, the source of all conscious beings, and the individual conscious beings, the Atma. Uh, down on the material level of the subtle material elements, you have uh, the first created being, Brahman, who produces personalities called the Prajapadis, who are the generators of material bodies. And they exist on this subtle mental and intellectual level, they're demigods. And they generate the forms of the plants and animals on our level of reality. So that involves the idea that you have intelligent conscious beings that by their reproductive activities can 
give birth to bodies not of their own species. But that happens in modern biology. There's something called interspecies embryo transfer, where you have animals giving birth to offspring who are not of their own species. So something like that, I think, happens. It involves uh, the use of seeds, beaches, and just to summarize, we, as conscious individual personal beings, we begin on the level of pure consciousness and have a form of pure consciousness or spirit. Consciousness can devolve into the world of matter and take on coverings of mind and ordinary matter. But it's a process that can be reversed and consciousness can be restored to its original pure state. And that's the purpose of different systems of yoga, meditation, contemplation, and prayer. And personally, I follow the system of bhakti yoga, I meditate on the Hare Krishna mantra, but I honor and respect the wisdom traditions of the world, all of them. And my guru used to give an example. You, if you have gold coins, you could stamp them with the symbols of different nations. But if it's really gold, it doesn't matter what symbol that you stamp on. Gold has its own value. So if you have some way of coming to the understanding, I'm a being of pure consciousness, you're a being of pure consciousness, we're all beings of pure consciousness. We should satisfy our material needs in the most simple, natural, fair, and efficient way possible while putting most of our human energy into developing that resource of consciousness that you've got. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Some of my books are available back there. Thank you, Michael. Don't go away. Uh, I feel badly that we skipped so many fascinating looking slides. Uh, but um, I can tell you I found myself getting totally lost in your books, uh, particularly human evolution. Uh, and it is really absorbing and really gets your mind going in different directions and channels, even if you've been thinking about this stuff. But anyway, we are here to thank you for a fantastic presentation, thought-provoking, and I hope that the uh, thoughts that they have provoked, you will share that with Michael. We have uh, we'll probably close to an hour for discussion and questions, and so, so please do. I'm going to give you back the... Why don't you do it? That will keep me out of the, the way. And, uh, so just... Do you want a chair? Can you get you a chair? I'm okay. Yeah, um, it might be a good idea if you have a question. Uh, stand up and speak loudly uh, so everybody can hear you. You could come up and use the mic, but I think that... Uh, if you can do it without the mic, yes, do so. This is just a recorder. Yeah. Um, you mentioned OH 86 and uh, the measuring of the bone. Uh, of, of, of I looked at the axes on the diagram you have the principal compound of one versus principal compound of two. This tells me there's exactly one measurement which is used to discriminate all of these bones. And this itself is a constraint of perception on the science. What was the measurement that was used for this experiment? 
I have to say, I only know that it was multivariate statistical analysis. I'm not a, a mathematician or a statistician in myself. So I personally don't have you know, the technical knowledge of the exact methodologies that the people involved in the many authors of the report actually employ, but I could give you the citation for the, the journal article. It looks like one, one thing was measured because principal components are, 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 are distributing on a single attribute. And when I see that. Yes. Uh, I do recall from having read the report that they made dozens of measurements and they did many different statistical analyses of the measurement that went into the making of their final conclusion. I selected for this presentation one of the many slides that they included in their original report and on the basis of the complete range of tests that they employed, they concluded that the OH86, in addition to the one slide that they showed, all of the evidence added up to their final conclusion, which I quoted from. This is I found something much more complicated. Yes. Thank you for that question. Thank you very much. It was a very compelling discussion. And the most compelling slide for me was the one where you were talking about the uh, uh, remote viewing. And you had it on top, it said normal, and then you had this squiggly line, anomalous. And my thought was, why is that normal and that's anomalous? You know, it's, it's the way that we, you know, perceive things that make them either normal or not. Um, and the, I believe very much. I study um, a data and I consciousness, I really subscribe to the idea that there is only consciousness. And that being the case, then we can know everything uh, that there is to know because it's only consciousness. You know, and I believe that it's all there is. Um, there is nothing else, so everything is not. Um, but in that slide that we're all viewing, what if there's some impediment that we have that really um, you know stops us from understanding that or knowing that or doing that. And I think that's really what is sort of Darwin's evolution, is the evolution of our mind, that um, the idea that you know, we have this prefrontal cortex that thinks in time and space, and in some way that's seen as, you know, a man marching forward and you know, being able to master the universe. But it's seen from a Vedic perspective that it's actually the evolution, that we're actually losing something because of that. I don't know if there's a question in there, but I'd just like to give my, uh, my appreciation. No, that's very that's very useful. Uh, as far as the diagram is concerned, uh, the diagram was from one of Robert John's publications. And yeah, it's, I can't say that I can completely represent all of his ideas or. Would you like me to address that? Yeah. And his co-author of that strange diagram. The idea we had is that we, we have ordinary, everyday interactions with our environment, okay? But usually they're sensory experiences. We hear, we see, we touch, we smell, etc. Down here, we're talking about phenomena that, that occur without any sensory channel. And therefore, they're not taking place, or they would appear not to be taking place 
between the cognitive brain and the physical environment, but rather at some unconscious or subconscious level where the distinction between mind and matter and physical and mental really becomes invisible anyway, and it's all one stuff. So it's very easy to transfer uh, information back and forth down there because there's no distinction. Does that help? Yeah, I, I think the point I'm trying to make is that it, that anomalous, which should be normal, should be like, you know, anomalous on the top and then normal on the bottom. Well, we were. I would agree with you, except if you're going to try to publish that for a sign of your you better turn it inside out. So the, those are very good points, Brenda, thank you. Uh, I would just add that according to the Vedic perspective, I mean, ultimately, I mean, there's one mantra, Sadhana, Kalyana, Brahma, that ultimately everything is spiritual or conscious. <clears throat> but when one departs from that level of spiritual understanding, then we get caught up in the dualities of matter and spirit and things like that. So, I'm trying to uh, understand one portion of this. As a person who was wondering about all of those of us who may be here and elsewhere who harbor, according to regular science and DNA stuff, a whole lot of Neanderthal or Denisovian stuff within us. So what I what my mind is going back and forth between is these earlier humans which you have compiled the uh, evidence for the existence of, is this human 1.0 and those of us here now are humans 2.0? In other words, a second try by all those uh, forces that may be in that middle place, the, um, the place I'm not trying to the the, the middle level of the yes. Yes, yeah, so in other words, did the first humans just die out or did they continue in India and all of us are just um, Neanderthal savages trying to, I mean, this is silly about it, but um, I think you get my point. Yes. It's interesting to me that the Vedic literature provides information that there are up to 400,000 different kinds of human life existing in the entire universe. So that's pretty interesting. So it isn't that a Darwinian scientist of the 19th century were the first to come up with the idea of pre-human hominins, you know, like Neanderthal, things of, of that sort. Uh, <clears throat> the real picture, as far as I can see, is from a Vedic perspective, is that there's a whole range of different types of bodies. Plant bodies, animal bodies, human bodies, demigod bodies. There's a whole range of them. Because the source of it all understands the different possible desires that conscious selves in the world of matter may have. Any kind of body, whether it's plant or animal or human 1.0 or human 2.0, is a vehicle for a conscious self. And the entire range is always available. At any particular moment in time, there may not be conscious selves who have the particular configuration of material desires that would require that particular 
body. And just like a clothing company, it, it may not sell winter coats in Florida in July. It's got winter coats, but just not there. So at the particular, this particular moment in time, there may not be any conscious syllables that have the configuration of desires, karma, in other words. Nobody has the karma for a Tyrannosaurus Rex on the other Therefore, they're not around. If some did have that particular karma or configuration of material desires, then we might see them, although technically they're considered extinct. But it's sort of like you know, computer companies that don't pre-manufacture products. They have plans for all the different computers. They have the components for them, but they don't actually assemble them and deliver them until there's a particular desire for them. So that's how we see it.
it's a very rough parallel, but you ask for something that's about as good as I can give you. I think there are also, I've seen, I mean, there are so many studies about cyclical events in climatology, uh, glaciations, you have the Nikhonovich uh, cycles. Some of them are in the same ballpark as a series of four yugas, about 4.32 4 million years. It is a very, very rough correspondences, not, not to be taken as scientifically proven correlations, but they're interesting and maybe they can be followed up on. I forgot your second question. It was about uh, scientific evidence of the effectiveness of modules. Uh, studies have been done by many people. It's not something that I'm particularly well informed about, but uh, there are there are such such reports. Maybe Christian. If you just, um, oh, after, after the call. Yeah, just get me your email and I have a video on that. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to do that. Okay. Yes. Sir. Um, this is going to be easier. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to go back to the word devolution. Uh, something going backwards or getting worse, uh, as uh, indicated by a science fiction story on the same name about 50 years ago. Uh, uh, what, what, is this, what does evolution really mean in terms of, of uh, how things go in the future relative to what they've done in the past? Okay, I use the evolution in a few different senses. The primary way that I use it is to illustrate the fact that as conscious individual personal beings, we don't evolve up from matter, basically. Because the, the idea that many people have today is that matter is primary. You combine matter in a sufficiently complex way in the brain and the nervous system. It generates what we call consciousness, but only temporarily only in association with a living brain. Uh, except that idea that as conscious beings we more or less evolve up from matter. Rather, it's consciousness that's primary. We're originally beings of pure consciousness, but consciousness can come into association with mind, with matter. And that process of consciousness becoming covered by subtle mental material energies and gross physical energies is what devolution. You can also use devolution to describe the process whereby a conscious self in the cycle of reincarnation becomes more and more deeply entangled in matter rather than becoming liberated from its contact with matter, which is extremely limiting. So those are the, and then, then you can also use devolution in terms of the description of the progress of the yugas, the time cycles, where you begin with a golden age called Satya Yuga, and then it's reduced by 25% in the next age, and another 25%. And then finally in the Kali Yuga, in which we're living now, good qualities are almost practically extinct in human society. So it's 
do the same as a devolution of land in this place. But the main sense in which I use the word, the implied name or the title of the book, is that as beings of pure consciousness, we don't evolve up from matter, we devolve and come down from pure consciousness or spirit. Well, there's a couple of other people. You can hold that. I wanted to know about, I said the theory where, do you know anything about the brain possibly being looked at as the receiver and the mind being transmitted? from like say a spirit verse, like I don't know if you wrote about it where matter might have coalesced from uh, a spirit or non-corporeal type of existence. So like a, a television set, if it just destroyed, the signal is still there. Like, because that's what it seems that, uh, not humans, but whatever we are, like when you said, what is a human being? We don't even know, you know, we're, we're still trying to classify that. and. When we're in the middle of working or doing something, we get these jolts of intelligence, like if we're tapping in or the, the line of transmission is more solid coming to our receiver, which is the brain. And then sometimes, next thing you know, you know we're, we're not that, you know, uh, in, 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 in a connection with it. You know, sort of like, it, it could be like you and I and everybody here is transmitting ourselves into the brains that are in the bodies that are here. So if the bodies are gone, that transmission is still there. Just where we see sometimes what could mistakenly be looked at as consciousness within animals as well, where they act more human than humans. I just want to know if you have any research on that. I think it's a very good idea that you express. Now, I, I like your example of, you know, say you have a television set, if that's destroyed, it doesn't mean that the television signal isn't there, so that the television set is just transmitting the you know, signal and it's not originating it. And I think that's a very good way to understand the relationship between the actual object the actual conscious individual personal entity that we really are with this gross physical body including the, the brain. Say if, I mean to use your analogy, if the gross physical body is destroyed, to put it in common terminology, it dies, that doesn't mean that the conscious self that was animating that uh, body with its consciousness spreading throughout it um, ceases to exist. So I, I think that's a very valid way of expressing an essential aspect of the, the Vedic philosophy. I want to add one more thing to the screen consciousness theory is if we could stream our consciousness into our brain, which would be the receiver. It, have you ran across anything that's possible where another could stream their con consciousness to where the one brain could actually pick up two or three or more signals? Well, that comes into one of the cases I might have gotten into if I had more carefully time this. And it has to do with a case that was studied by William James, uh, who was the founder of modern psychology. He mentions this case in his book, The Principles of Psychology. And he calls the case the Wat Seika Wonder. It's a case of what he regarded, a genuine case of what he regarded as a case of 
spirit possession, which is exactly uh, what you were talking about. And he, he called this case the Wat Sega Wonder, and it has to do with some events that took place in a town called Wat Sega in the state of Illinois. And it just so happens that in Los Angeles, I live on Watsika Avenue, or for whatever, whatever synchronicity that implies. And this case had to do with the Venom family. They had a daughter named Lorancy. And she lived quite an ordinary life until she reached about the age she is in that photograph. And and she began having trance visions. And in, this, in these trance visions, she came in contact with the spirit of a recently departed girl named Mary Roth. And just to put it very briefly, you know, basically what happened is Mary Roth told her, I'd like to use your body to visit my parents who live near where you do. So, Lorenzi communicated this to her parents and others, and they arranged for the Roth family to come to the Lorenzi home. And when they were coming, Lorenzi immediately recognized them, although according to the reports, she'd never seen them before. And uh, she recognized, well, that's my mother, that's my sister, that's... And basically what appears to have happened is that, as you were putting it, you know, the consciousness of Mary Roth began to manifest itself through the body and brain of Lorenzi Venom. So both families agreed that she should go and live in the Roth house, which she did for several weeks, and she behaved perfectly as their departed daughter, displaying all kinds of memory of detailed affairs of the family that would only have been known to her. And then, after some time, she again went into trance states, and the consciousness of Mary Long said, okay, I'm finished, I saw my parents. And then, Lorenzi began to feel like a stranger in the Roth home, and both families agreed she should go back to the Venoms, and she did. So uh, that would appear to be, to me, anyway, to be a case of the kind that you're talking about where two conscious entities are making use of the same gross physical form. And as I said, to, to me it was kind of significant that William James, the father of modern psychology, included this case in his textbook, Principles of Psychology, is what he at the time regarded as a genuine case of what he called spirit possession. This size. Finally, somebody with this size. Go ahead. So, the question I have is that you heard of uh, uh, the science of consciousness conference that happens in Tucson, Arizona. And there's a person by the name of Stuart Hamerov. He's a doctor and alumni kind of a famous physicist, Roger Hamerov, so you get. They have a theory that uh, consciousness happens because of quantum states in something called microtubules, which are inside of the brain. And there's a discovery in Japan in 2014, which proved that partially cured some kind of proof that cure. So that theory, I mean, I, I cannot explain it uh, 
very clearly what else is to be partially explained for after life experience. I mean, some people believe that that theory can. But it's basically somehow guys quantum mechanics and physics and microphysics and the brain. And that seems to be the closest that uh, science is kind of now towards. Okay. In January of this year, I heard Stuart Hamilton himself give a presentation of that idea at a conference organized by Dr. Devante Institute of Gainesville, Florida. Brenda was there, she also gave a presentation. Uh, personally, I don't accept what Stuart Hameroff says. Uh, I don't think that consciousness is produced by microtubules in the brain. It may, the microtubules in the brain may be part of the apparatus by which Consciousness, which has its own independent existence, is manifested in the human organism. That may be part of, of the picture. But, and I know the conference toward the science of consciousness. I've made presentations at it twice, and maybe I'll do it again. Thanks for that. Almost everything's over on the normal side, and just a few little outliers. But your book, the Yay Big, so tell us approximately how many cases of these outlying ancient human evidence for her antiquity. I mean, it seems like it's possible. Enough to put up the 900 pages <laughs> book. Uh, but, uh, there, there's more than is in that book. That book, I believe, is the tip of the iceberg. I've got another book of almost the same size and other cases that have come to my attention since the original book was published in 1993. I'd say I'm about 95% finished with the manuscript of that book. So it's. Uh, we're not talking about one or two cases, there are quite a few. Yeah, well, it depends whether you're going to consider, you know, if there's a discovery of 500 artifacts that are anomalous, you count them as 500 or one. Yeah. If you count them as one, then you've got at least hundreds of cases. If you count individual things that were discovered at a particular site, you may be into the tens of thousands. So, thanks. Yes? Who made this? Where did they get all that information? How do they know all that stuff? How do they know all that stuff? Yeah, that's the only thing. How do they know? Where did they get their information? Well, the whole, Veda is a Sanskrit word that means knowledge. And it's based on the principle of, of consciousness-based universe, where there is a supreme conscious source of everything that exists, has existed, will ever exist. And that, that conscious source has the ability to communicate knowledge about that to human society for its benefit. So it's it's not like our current conception of knowledge where we each individually has to do research and gather facts and evaluate them. According 
to the traditional way of understanding things, which I presented to you. There is a conscious self that has perfect, complete knowledge and can express it. It does so originally in the form of sound. That's how this information is originally transmitted. Because at a certain point in time, the human intelligence and mind and abilities were so developed that they could simply hear something and remember it forever. Now we tend to forget things. So things have to be put into writing. And when that's done, it has to be edited down to our particular understanding. So that's what we're getting now. But ultimately, it's something, knowledge is something always exists. Well, who wrote the papers? How long ago were they written? Uh, they were put in written form. Again, we have to keep in mind the idea that time is simple. There have been many creations, many universities, again and again and again. And in all of them, the Vedic knowledge was communicated. So in this cycle, in this universe, on this planet that we happen to be on right now, in the Kali Yuga, the time the Vedas that we have were set into writing is about 5,000 years ago. That doesn't mean that they began then, but that just means at that time, uh, the Vedic knowledge was put into a form that's accessible to us in a written form around that time. So it was found by archaeologists? Uh, there are different ways of getting knowledge. If we're talking about the way that archaeologists and other modern scholars get knowledge, they would probably say, the Vedic literature dates to about 1000 BC, somewhere around there. And they would say those are the oldest evidences that we have for it. And they would take that evidence for linguistics, archaeology, different disciplines of that sort. According to the Vedic system itself, there's another way to get knowledge through what's called parantara, transmission from guru to disciple and chain going all the way, way, way back in time. If archaeological evidence is what you're looking for, you would probably have to say I mean, depending, there are many different categories of Vedic literature, the Puranas, the Vedas, the Upanishads. The Rig Veda is generally considered to be the oldest. And they would say, based on their linguistic studies, and archaeological studies, and other studies, come from about 1000 BC, around that period of time. Uh, is there somebody else who, okay, you had a question, he has a question. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. I have read the Vedic archaeology of So there's no, I don't know, thousands of examples. My question would be in the Vedic principles and aspects to the view, time, the man views time in a linear experience. Is this being for this, this happens, all that happens? Is this merely an illusion, and is there a great concept that describes these illusions as a linear time as from this great viewpoint? That even some of our lifetimes could be running concurrently because linear time is really a construct of the material world only. Very good point. Uh, there is a distinction that can be between. 
between time on the spiritual level of reality, the level that you might call Brahman or Vaikunta or what I sometimes call the level of pure consciousness, where time exists in the sense that there's some ordering of things that happen. Yeah, they're, they're linked in some, what, some temporal way, but there's no destructive force of time. Time on the material level of reality is inextricably linked with increasing entropy. <clears throat> in other words, it's destructive. Things don't persist over the course of time. So uh, that's why in the material level of reality as we experience time, we experience old age, disease, ultimately death, whatever's created is ultimately destroyed, whether it's a universe or a building or a body. It's but there's a part of us, the actual conscious self, that is ultimately beyond that and is desiring to express itself on that higher level of reality where there is variety in terms of one thing happening after another, but that whole destructive aspect of it is missing. Yes? Yeah, I'm interested in how you spent so many years and so much effort to establish a credible foundation to the notion that human life is something more than we can track historically and materially. If, if your work were to reach fulfillment, how would it change things? How would it change things? Well, it would change our sense of identity, ultimately. And to a large extent, our values, our goals, and objectives are linked to our sense of identity, what I think I really am. For example, if I think I'm an American man, then I behave according to my conception of what an American man is. Something, something like that. So, what I'm proposing and you said the reason I'm talking about, for example, archaeological evidence for extreme activity isn't because I ultimately care about how long humans have existed on this planet. Why that particular topic is of significance to me is that it seems to indicate with me new explanations for human origins. And as I indicated, the current dominant conception in the world of science and academics generally is that we're, in one sense or another, organisms or machines or rock, whatever terminology you want to put on it, but whatever it is we are, it's strictly physicalist, materialist. Consciousness and mind are epiphenomena, according to this point of view. And that point of view tends to lead to goals that are materialist, values that are materialist. It tends to lead us to divide ourselves up into groups based on superficial identities that have nothing to do with the original 
or real conscious self. It leads us to identify ourselves on the basis of race, for example, or nationality. And not just divide ourselves up into groups, but to divide ourselves into competing groups. And if those are the kinds of values that are being, being propagated throughout the society, then we shouldn't be surprised to see the effects of that. Uh, whether it's uh, division, wars, environmental destruction, uh, um, exploitation of people based on class, race, religion, nationality, and so forth. So I would say that the, the benefit of trying to establish an identity for the human beings on this planet that is more consciousness based and that ultimately we're not purely material beings in competition with each other for survival. But that would have beneficial effects on us each individually in terms of what we see as happiness and worth things worth striving for and collectively as a society and ultimately I, I, I just came a few couple weeks ago from a meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists in Bern, Switzerland and I could see the burning question among them was something that had, at least on the surface, not very much to do with archaeology, you know, taken as the study of pot shards and human bones and stone tools and things of that sort. What they were concerned about is what can we do as archaeologists to influence the direction that Europe and the world are going in now, which things to them appear to be spiraling out of control, getting back into a world where large-scale conflict again seems possible, where the disparities in wealth are becoming more and more extreme, where they're just wondering what can we do, you know, as archaeologists to reverse these trends. And I'm sitting there and I'm just thinking, you're missing a very important point because the direction that you're going in now, when you're focusing on the human identity as materialists, pretty strictly ignoring this identity, this alternate way of identifying as the conscious self within the body, that's the only way the problems say you're thinking about have any hope of being ameliorated by. So those are a few of my incoherent thoughts about that. Yes? What you say is very accurate. I've heard that I'm in Chinese medicine. And I'm, I'm sorry. I'm in Chinese medicine, and with us, I've, I've often heard that there is this assessment of what's happening right now for the purposes that you, you say. You very much align with the history, although we're different in Chinese medicine, and we have different ways, it's very similar in being. And there is, well, well, even the mathematicians that I've discussed, there is a whole movement to, to go to the next level and where we found ourselves. It's not really where we want to be. 
I won't go into the reasons. You know, you have an understanding of what they are. Medicine, you know, Same attitude thing. But there is definitely an accepted feeling. I've heard from different universities, different people, coming from China, mathematicians who are at different universities who lecture on how medicine is come around and how we and what how do you approach how we approach. But it's true. It's happening. Yes, I, I, I think you're right. I think there is yes. an opportunity to shift things. Mm -hmm. I mean, according to the particular thinking path that I follow, the system of bhakti yoga, Krishna consciousness, that even though the general trend of our Kali Yuga is downward towards increasing social and environmental disturbance, that there is an opportunity, uh, especially now for the next few thousand years, to turn things around you know, so that there is kind of Indian summer, although the winter is coming on. So that opportunity is there. I think a lot of people feel it, that even though there are so many signs of uh, increasing social and environmental disturbance, that simultaneously there is a movement towards that next step. I kind of mention it, you know, I have a cross-cultural study of cosmologies as part of my book, Human Evolution in which I mentioned the traditional Chinese system of thought, including medicine, as involved in a lot of these same principles. Thank you. Um, I find myself wondering if we've been around that long, how come we're still so stupid? <laughs> but, uh, Michael, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure there's more discussion we can have, but we have to be out of here by 4 o'clock, and I want to give you time to talk to each other, to maybe get a cup of coffee, uh, to look at the books, and hopefully to buy some. Again, I, I can't have enough praise for Michael's books. They're really superb. Thank you all for coming. Uh, our next our next meetup is going to be on uh, October 19th. Uh, Dale Graff will be speaking, will be sending out an announcement, and I think that will also be uh, a fascinating uh, presentation. But Michael, we are privileged to have you with us. Thank you for coming all this way and for sharing some of your insights and experiences with us.